19, and once you find your place in John 19, if you want to turn to Luke 23 and shut your bulletin, uh, we'll be headed over there uh, in just a few moments. Luke 19, and then John, or Luke 19, I got that wrong. John 19, Luke 23. I'll get it right sooner or later. We'll begin in John chapter 19. We'll look at verse 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw His mother and the disciples standing by whom He loved, He saith unto His mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith He to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we open up your word, Father, we thank you that it is the truth, and Father, in it is no error. Father, we thank you, Lord, that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, as we open it this day, may it illuminate our hearts. Father, as you have promised, may it never return full. Father, may it accomplish this day that for which you set forth for it to accomplish the heart of each one is in this place. To those today who need to call upon you as Savior Lord, may today be the day of salvation. Father, for those of us that are your children, may you do a work within each of us as we need, as you see fit. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see that which your word has for us this day. In the name of your precious Son, our Savior, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to begin, as I said last week, and we're going to look at, starting, we're not going to look at all of them today, we're not going to get that far, uh, the seven sayings that Jesus utters from the cross. Uh, now I'm going to have a little bit of a disclaimer, we're not going to look at them in order. Uh, preacher's privilege, he's going to move them around a little bit. Um, but all seven sayings are uttered from Christ once He has been nailed to the cross, and as He spends what we assume, believe to be six hours hanging there uh, on the cross. And so this covers the last hours of His life. His ministry um, from an aspect is coming down to the end. He's not going to heal anymore. He's not going to cast any more demons. He's not going to walk from Jerusalem to Capernaum to Galilee down to Jericho. His ministry for all intents and purposes other than the most important aspect of His ministry, that which He does on the cross, uh, His earthly ministry is drawing to an eye. And yet, in the cross, we see seven statements made by our Savior that are on a wide variety of different perspectives, but are each vitally important to show us not only what He came to do, but to show us a glimpse of who He is both as God, but also as man. And so we're going to look at these. Three of them are focused to the Father. One, we see this morning, is focused towards His mother. One is focused towards the thief. Another is focused to those that He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so different aspects of uh, the heart of our Savior that we see as we get glimpses of Him on the cross. Now, we have to understand as He's laying on, hanging on the cross, the last 24 to 36 hours has been utterly excruciating for our Savior. He's been betrayed. He's been beaten. Um, he's been on trial. He's been moved back and forth from the high priest to Pilate to Herod to the high priest, back to Pilate, then to the cross. He's been moved here and there. All kinds of different things have happened. They pulled his beard out. They put a crown of thorns up on his head. And when I mean thorns, I mean they're as the size of my little finger. Um, these aren't just little bitty ones. They've mashed it down on his head. They spit on him. They smacked him. They scourged him with the cat and nine tails. And what that picture is is they they tied him to a whooping post, probably on his knees. And they took a cat and nine tails, and that's a um, leather strap about that long 
that had nine little tails that come out of it. Each one of those was dipped in tar and then taken while the tar was still hot and laid in pieces of metal and glass and pottery to where they would fix itself to it. All nine of those. And then they would lay him there and they would pull back and they would swing. And as it would wrap around from his back to his chest, they would then yank it out. And those pieces of pottery and glass would grab pieces of flesh and just throw them everywhere. And some of those may even get stuck in him as they rip them out. And they've done this 39 times. Historically speaking, according to Roman history, most men that faced the cross never made it to the cross. They died in the beating that preceded the cross. But then they made him carry his own cross. And as he headed to Calvary, of course, he could not go any farther. He could not carry it, so they got Joseph, Arimathea, to carry it the rest of the way. Then they got him to Calvary. They laid the cross down on the ground. They laid him on the cross. And they then nailed his hands and feet to the cross. The nails were said to be as nine inches long. Can you imagine the excruciating pain as those Roman soldiers began to drive those nails to the hands and their feet of our Savior? And then they would lift the cross up in a hole that was already prepared and they would drop it down. And at the moment that cross hit the bottom of that hole, can you imagine the, the shaking and the riveting of our Savior's body uh, from that sudden stop as it hit, as His entire body jarred from the utter pain and agony. It would take him excruciating pain to breathe because he, every time he would have to lift up on his legs. And lest we forget, in his feet, which he would use to lift up, there's this nine inch nail driven through both of them. So every time he went to lift, there's this utter agony and this uh, just terrible pain just shooting through his body. Every breath he took was in agony. And yet in the midst of this, in those last six hours, He spoke seven times. To say that these seven are somewhat important, I think would be an understatement. Because it gives us a glimpse into what is in the heart of our Savior in the midst of the most agonizing, painful time in His life and in His history. Because not only is there the physical aspect of the pain, there is the other which we'll look at next week. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Above all the physical pain, I tell you it pales in comparison to the spiritual agony of having the Father turn His back upon His Son because He who knew no sin became sin. And at the moment He drank that bitter cup to become sin, the Father cannot look upon sin. So the Father had to turn His eyes from His Son. And the spiritual agony of the separation from the Father and the weight of the sin of the entire world resting upon our Savior had to be by far worse than the physical agony ever could have been. And in the midst of the physical and the spiritual agony, we see these seven saints uttered from our Savior's Son. So the first one we're going to look at this morning is found there in John 19. John's the only one that records this um, saying from Christ as He's on the cross and uh, technically in the line. I think this one's third. But again, I've rearranged the order a little bit. And so, He looks down after being on the cross for some time. How long? We have no idea. And He sees His mother there and He sees the disciple whom He loved. Well, the disciple whom He loved is none other than John. Thus, the writer of this Gospel. Um, and now John, as he writes this, John's probably in his late 80s, early 90s when he's writing this. And he's reflecting back on something that there's no way in this world he could ever forget. How in the world could you forget what he saw? The picture of love on the cross. Now, where are all the other disciples at? They're not there. They're gone. Now, they come back. But they're not at the cross. As far as we know, the only disciple at the cross is John. 
And you know what's the funniest about that? He said to be the youngest of the disciples. Said to be nearly 17 or 18 when he was called. So at this age, he may only be 21, 20, 21, maybe 22 years old. The youngest of the disciples is the one that, guess what? Stayed. This seems somewhat ironic to me. But you would think with Peter and all of his brashness, I'll never deny you. Of course he does. I'll die for you. He does. 40 years later. And yet John's the one that stayed. And here's John writing this beautiful picture. Jesus looking down and in tender heart sees his mother. Now, whose responsibility was she? She was Jesus's. Joseph is dead. Jesus, upon his father's death, took all responsibility for his mom and the family business. He, he became the, the head carpenter. He became the owner, the CEO. He was in charge. It was his job to take care of his four brothers and his mama. That was his job. And he'd done so until it was time to step forth with his public ministry. And so for the last three and a half years, he's entrusted his mom to his brothers. But now death is coming. And so Jesus looks down from the cross. And I find this very interesting. He doesn't give his oldest brother, the next oldest, the responsibility of taking care of mom. He doesn't give them any of the next three. He gives it to one of his disciples. Now, scholars will, you know how those scholars love to argue and debate. They'll debate over why. But the most logical reason I've ever heard is very simple. At this point, all four of his brothers are still lost as far as we know. They, they rejected his ministry. Matter of fact, twice, even his mother, and, the, and they come and say, hey, you need to cut this junk out and come home. We need you. They didn't understand his ministry. They didn't understand his purpose. And so, it could be that... But then again, he's God. He knew his brothers were going to. At least two of them we know did. James, authors of the book of the New Testament, and Jude, authors of the book of the New Testament. So, why John? I'd like to be able to give you an answer. I don't know. You know why? Because God said so. Because that's who Jesus trusted with the care of His mother. I don't know why He didn't choose one of His brothers. I don't know why He didn't choose one of the other disciples. Maybe because they weren't there. But He looks down and who does He see at the cross standing beside comforting His mother? He sees John. The youngest of the disciples, but the one that Jesus had a special bond with. Now, please don't misunderstand this. Jesus loved all the disciples. He even loved Judas, the one that betrayed him. But there was, on an earthly side, there was a special connection between him and John. Now, that doesn't necessarily make sense. But you think about it. It does. I would hope that you all could look around the room and say you love each other. I hope. But there are some in this church that you're a little closer to than others. I always pick on John's class. He's got several in his class. They vacation together. They torment the pastor. I mean, they, they support the pastor together. But they're close. They go on vacation. They do things together. They go out to eat. They go to auctions. They love the rest of us as much as they love each other. But there's a special friendship, a special bond. they got things in common, age. There's just a special connection there. Jesus loved all of His disciples. But there was something unique about His relationship with John. He trusted John. Maybe He knew John was going to live the longest. I, I don't know. But can you imagine in tenderness, He looks down and He beholds His mother. And in the midst of agony and pain and near death, what does he want to do? He wants to make sure his mom is taken care of. And we, we see a, a glimpse into the earthly side of our Savior and the love that he had for the woman whose life was radically changed the moment an angel came and said, Behold, you're going to give birth to the Christ child. How many? I've never known a man. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. 
And you are going to be the mother of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Miriam was 13, 14, maybe 15 years old. Her life got flipped upside down. And yet in tenderness, Jesus takes care of his mom. John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And until the day that God called her home, who took care of her? John did. Why? Because Jesus asked him to. And so we see a glimpse of love, a, a glimpse of care. Now, I've tried to put myself in, in Mary's shoes and in John's shoes. What were they thinking when Jesus began speaking? And when Jesus looked at her and looked over at John and says, Woman, behold your son. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. I don't know that we can place ourselves in either shoes. But from Mary's perspective, there had to be just this deep feeling of one despair because her son's on the cross. But two, a recognition of just how much her son loved her, even though she didn't do what he'd asked. What did she ask? Come home. Stop this stuff. Come home. She didn't realize. It was for her sake. He couldn't stop. It was for our sake. He had to endure the cross. She, all the way back at his birth, heralded her, the angel, that my salvation, she recognized that he was her salvation, but she didn't just realize to the death that he was her only hope for eternal life. And the love that was there the compassion, the tenderness, as we see our Savior call out to His mother to make sure she's provided for and taken care of. Now, turn over to Luke 23. We're going to have rather a, a somewhat lengthy uh, passage. We'll begin in verse 26. Luke 23, 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold on one sign of a Cyrenian uh, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross uh, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women which wailed in lamenting him. But Jesus turned unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say, The mountains fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there was with, were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they came to the place which is called Calvary, they were crucified, him and the malefactors, one on the right and one on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And as the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so here we pick up and beginning... There in verse 34, we see uh, what is actually the first sign of the cross, the second we're going to look at today. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see Jesus speak to the crowd, or the women, as they're lamenting, as He's being led away. 
Uh, again, when we pick up here, he's been led away. He's already been beaten and all those other things. He's been nailed to the cross. The cross has been placed. And Jesus begins uh, those six hours. Sometime in the beginning of that six hours, Jesus utters these words in a prayer to the Father. So we want to look at three aspects of this. One, we want to look at the address. Notice that He speaks to the Father. This is again one of several times that Jesus prays from the cross. And so the first words that Jesus utters from the cross, He speaks to the Father. Now, in this aspect, again remind you, what can the Father not do? You can't look upon sin. And so as Jesus has drank the cup, and as Jesus, and I mean that metaphorically, but as He has taken upon Himself the wrath of all humanity, the sin of all humanity, God, not looking upon sin, can't look upon His Son. And yet, in utter despair, Jesus cries out to the only one that He can cry out to. And that is His Heavenly Father. And we see... Again, this intimacy, and I don't, I don't know there's any way I can describe it. I don't know there's any way we can understand it. There is but six hours in all of eternity that the Father and Son have not been together as one. And that's these six hours on the cross. I don't know that we can even begin to fathom the, the spiritual anguish of being separated from His Father. Um, they were one. They are one. But in this glimpse and moment in time, sin separated as He drank uh, the bitter cup of sin for all of humanity. And so in anguish, He cries out. Why do we think of the garden? The garden was so intense as He swept drops of blood. Let this cup pass from me. I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to take. And so you see the, the dual uh, aspects of Jesus in conflict with one another. In His deity, as God, He knows the price must be paid. The Father's wrath must be appeased. Sin must be cleansed. But it is humanity. I don't want pain. I want to go through this. I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to feel this pain. I don't want to be separated from my Father. And as He is there on the cross, He addresses His Father in passion, in tenderness, but as it's always wrapped up in, in love. So we see the address. Now we see the, the plea, if you will. Father, forgive me. Here's a man who's been betrayed, who's been beaten, who's been abandoned by everybody but one disciple. Here's a man that just a few days ago, the crowd laid their clothes at his feet and branches and held him as Hosanna. That, that same crowd just a few days later cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. He's been betrayed by the crowd, betrayed by Judas. The Father has had to turn His back on Him. The disciples have abandoned Him. He's hanging there on a cross, becoming, having become sin, who knew no sin. And what does He cry? He doesn't cry for justice. He doesn't cry for vengeance. That's what most of us would cry for. I don't deserve this. Guess what? He didn't. It was us that put him there. He had never sinned. He could not sin. He knew no sin. But yet he had to become sin. But he didn't cry out for his innocence. He didn't cry out. <coughs> for deliverance, for vengeance. He didn't cry to get even. 
cried out in forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They have no clue what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. So not only does He say, Father, forgive them, not only does He ask the Father for their forgiveness, He then even begins to advocate on their behalf. Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. But we do. Forgive them anyway. It had to be this way. But He's saying to forgive them to the soldiers that just nailed Him to the cross. To the guys that just railed him and spit on him, plucked out his beard, smashed a crown of thorns upon his head. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. But one day they will. see others. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. Where they've been or where they've not been. Jesus utters the same plea for them. Father, forgive me. They don't know. They don't know. And so as, as we go about and as we leave the doors here in a few minutes, we go back to this. How do we see people? Do we see them for the way we want to see them or do we see them the way Jesus sees them? Jesus sees them as someone worth dying for. Jesus sees them as someone He wants the Father to forgive. Jesus sees them with eyes of compassion. <clears throat> Blood drops of love. Because He knows who they can be in Him. Fell to ask him into her awful. Father, forgive them. They don't know. When he says, Father, forgive them, that includes us. We pray for our forgiveness even before we were even in any way thought of. Because he loved us that much. That's hard for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to understand. But that is the heart of God. A heart that even in the midst of agony and pain from the cross is crying out for the Father to forgive because they don't recognize the freedom. Thirdly, the third thing that we're going to look at this morning is the next one following here in Luke's Gospel. He said, Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now he comes down and he says, Unto the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. In the midst of the agony and the pain in the midst of the cross and everything going on, in the midst of being berated and being riled and mocked and laughed at, a, a conversation strikes up between Jesus and these two thieves. Now, the one thief is the one that's doing all the running in his mouth. Uh, you know, hey, if you're God, you know, if you really are who you say you are, save yourself. Notice what he says next. And us. Yeah, don't forget me. And he says it. Not in a sincere tone, but in a very mocking, um, making fun of Jesus because in the one thief's mind, he's not really who he says he is. If he was, he wouldn't be here. I mean, let's put ourselves in the thief's position. Logical conclusion, if you're really God, what are you doing here with us? It doesn't make logical sense. But again, we said most things, what God does and the ways that God does them, doesn't make logical sense. Because he's God. If it makes sense to us, there would be no faith involved. And there has to be faith, so it doesn't make sense. And so he, he doesn't get it. 
Again, you go back. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He doesn't understand. In the midst of the one picking on Jesus, the other guy speaks up. And he begins to take up for Jesus. That's what he begins to do. But the other answering rebuked the other thief. Do you not fear God? Seeing you're in the same condemnation? What are you talking about? Look where we're at. Don't you have any respect for the Lord? Don't you fear God? And he goes on to say, we're here because we deserve to be here. We're here justly. He says it. We're here for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done what? Nothing. So look look at the conversation. How it turns. At first, at least the one thief is sarcastically picking on Jesus. This thief then comes to defend verbally Jesus to the other thief. Then him and Jesus begin, uh, or him and the other thief begin to talk about who Jesus is. The one thief says, don't you fear God? Recognizing and assuming that he believes Jesus is who? He's God. Otherwise, why would you have said so? He then admits his own guilt. Hey, he professes guilt on the other guy. Now, historically, these were two guys that were in a, a little group with, with Barabbas. That's, that's the historical tradition anyway. I don't know if it's biblical, but it's tradition. And so these two guys would have got caught together along with Barabbas. Barabbas would have been the ringleader. Barabbas gets let loose. And so the ringleader goes away and the other two guys get what? They get crucified beside Jesus. Instead of Barabbas being crucified with his two cohorts, the two get Jesus because the crowd chose Barabbas. And so these guys probably knew each other probably very well. And so he begins to proceed to inform them of just how guilty they are. We're getting exactly what we And you see a glorious picture as this. We see the thief come to Christ. We see a glorious picture of the process of salvation. Before we can get saved, we first must have to admit our what? Our guilt. It's hard to admit when we're guilty, isn't it? We want to justify it. Really, really you know, all the times I got spanked as a child, it was all my sister's fault. Everyone. I didn't do anything wrong. It was all Debbie's fault. She's older than me anyway. You know, we don't like to be, even today as adults, we'll justify why we do something wrong. Well, it wasn't my fault. It was so-and-so's fault. How he got my first church was, a, was an auto uh, body guy. He smashed his thumb at work, come to church and said, if I'd been praying for him harder, he wouldn't have smashed his thumb. Now, he, he's joking. But, I mean, we don't try to blame anybody with anything other than our own fault. Whether it's an accident, smashing his thumb, or we've actually committed a sin. Well, I wouldn't have really been gossiping, but you know, the three or four people were around me, and I just got caught up in the moment. It, it, it's their fault. If they had to start it, I'd never join. But it's still our fault because we did what? We joined. <coughs> and yet, this thief has to admit, I'm getting what I deserve. Now, you go down to the jail ministry with Bob and some of them. Every one of them down there are innocent. innocent. And we're all in the same way. We don't want to acknowledge our sin. We don't want to acknowledge our wretchedness. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the uh, wretch. We don't, like, we don't like that word. There's a movement at one time to change it to a person like me instead of a wretch like me. Because we don't like to admit those things. I'm a good person. I'm a nice guy. No, I'm not. I'm a miserable, wretched sinner. And I've got to acknowledge that sin. I've got to acknowledge my guilt. I've got to acknowledge the fact that I'm lost. This sinner first, this speak, first acknowledges his guilt. He acknowledges his sin. He acknowledges what he deserves. And folks, let's be honest and let's admit it. We all deserve hell. 
We deserve to die in our sins. Just like this thief was dying because of this. <clears throat> That's where we go to the thanks be to God. While we were dead in trespasses and sins, yet hath He quickened us. He made a way. He acknowledges His sin and His guilt. Secondly, notice what He does. Not only does He acknowledge Jesus as God, He also acknowledges Jesus as what? Innocent. This man hasn't done anything. Now, I don't think the thief on the cross truly understands why Jesus is on the cross. But he understands enough to know that only he can save him and the eternal destiny that he's headed towards. I don't think he understands all the doctrinal lining up of Jesus drinking the bitter cup. and He, he didn't get all that. But here's what he does get. I'm guilty. I deserve death. This man standing in the middle here beside me is innocent and he's God. And he's the only one that can forgive me. And so after acknowledging his guilt and acknowledging that Jesus is God and that Jesus is perfect and innocent, he does the only thing left that he knows to do. He cries out and utters some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture, remember me when thou comest to the night. Remember me. No, he didn't pray the perfect sinner's prayer, but he made the perfect plea. In the midst of your innocence, and in the realization of the fact that you are God, in the midst that I'm getting what I deserve, instead of making fun of Jesus, he called out to Jesus and says, remember me. Whenever your kingdom, however that works out, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so Jesus responds, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. What a glorious group of words. Can you imagine how they had to just resonate was in the ear of that thief. It was, as, it was as if, I think in a moment of time, he felt for a glimpse, no pain. Because there was such rejoicing in the spiritual realization that his sins had been forgiven, that that very day, he was going to be in paradise with this man hanging between him and the other thief. That just for a moment of time, it was as if time stood still. And everything was okay. Because Jesus had taken away his kids. Notice he didn't get off the cross. He still had to reap his just reward. He had to continue the physical agony of the punishment that he had occurred because of what he had done. But the spiritual guilt was washed away. You see, dear friends, we've got to understand, when we come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean that everything in life just vanishes and everything's wonderful and peachy and great. The bad decisions we've made, the mistakes we've made, we're still stuck in some of those. I mean, you get saved today, and I promise you, your, your debt's just not going to just get erased tomorrow. No one's going to pay your house off. If they do, give them my name as well, please. I mean, those things just don't happen. The mistakes we've made, whether it's out in a car crash, whether it's uh, mistakes, those pains and aches, they're still there. The physical part is still there. Those men and women that get saved in the jail ministry, they don't get out of jail just because they got saved. They've still got to deal with the issues and the mistakes and the choices they've made. But their eternal punishment, the punishment for their sin is and there is no more eternal punishment. All their sin is wiped away. Cast as far as the east is from the west. Washed as white as snow. It's there no more. That doesn't mean that everything in life all of a sudden gets taken away. But I guarantee you it doesn't mean this. I'm forgiven. I'm adopted into the family of God. And now as I have to deal with these things, 
I have an advocate with me. The Lord will lead me. He will direct me. He will take care of me. He will provide for me. Why? Because He's adopted me into His family. He's forgiven me of all my sin. And He's promised to never leave me nor forsake me. We have no idea how long the thief lived from the moment Jesus uttered these words. But he had a promise. Today, you'll be a great promise. Obviously, today, if you're here and you're lost, I can't make you that promise. But I can't make you this promise. But if you'll acknowledge your guilt, if you'll acknowledge that Jesus is God, and on Calvary He took your sin, the sin of the world, and three days later He rose again, defeating that sin, that today He'll remove all of your sin, all of His penalty. All his punishments. And today he will impart to you eternal life. That when you close your eyes in death in this world, you will open them up and behold the face of your Savior and your King and your Lord. Never head down that right close. As those going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. in a song of invitation. The purpose of this is very simple. We invite you to come. If you need to come and pray for someone, maybe you've got a lost family member. If you need to come and say, Lord, I know you as Savior. I've accepted you, but Father, I'm not living the way I should. In light of everything that you've done for me, help me to surrender my life to you afresh. Maybe you're here today and you've never received the forgiveness of God. <coughs> today you're going to have the opportunity to acknowledge your guilt. To confess Jesus as Savior. And to ask Him into your heart. As He cried from the cross, Father, forgive them. That them included you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to look at you and tell you that today your sins have been completely forgiven. Have been cast away. But you've got to come and acknowledge your guilt. And you've got to turn to Him and ask Him in your heart. He's not going to force Himself. He's not going to pry His way in. But through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, draw you and He will call it to you. Here in this moment as we sing, I'm going to ask you if, you if you feel that tugging in your heart, if you've never had your sins forgiven, the moment we begin singing, you come. And let me get here on the altar and bend His knee. And help me, let me help you come to know Jesus as your Savior. Father, we love you. Father, we give this invitation to you. Father, there are those here today that need to know you. They need to confess their sin. As your spirit is convicting and drawing, Father, may you give them boldness to step out. Call upon your name. As you in your heart. Take this invitation. Use it as you see fit. It's in Christ's name we pray. 336. Standing as we sing, hymn number 336.